<laughs> so let's bring in our guest. He is he is Mark Long. He covers the Florida Gators for the Associated Press. Mark, you got John Schmelk and Jeff Fiegels here in the Northeast. I'm sure Florida has much better weather than we do right now. Yeah, most of the you time know, they do. I just can't believe Fiegels is old enough to have three drinking age children. Four. Two, whatever four. It is. Mark, I have four, four. drinking age kids. Yeah. Holy I God, know. I feel like you I feel like you were punting two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, Mark, that actually... I wish I was. See, Mark, <laughs> actually, Mark, actually, that's yeah. kind of true. He just punted till he was about 60. So that, <laughs> that's the thing. I know. I know. Well, hey, it goes by quickly. That's for sure. I'm on my 11th year of uh, being retired. If you can believe that, Mark, it's Jeez. been a long time. Wow, it flies by. It does. It certainly does. It really does. So I usually like to lead these interviews off, but Jeff has such a love affair with Kyle oh. Pitts. I'm just going to let him go, and then Thank I'll pick you, John. up. Go, Jeff. Mark, so when we start this, you know, once the season is over, we get a little bit of a break and we kind of start to go into our our uh, our draft makeup and free agency and things like this. And looking at this draft board and players that are coming out this year, immediately I went to this guy and I said to myself, you know, we talk about, and I, there's, the word generation is generational talent is not thrown around a while, uh, a lot, but he, around here it has been because we have a Saquon Barkley who was termed as that generational player. I, this guy is a generational player, Kyle Pitts. I am infatuated by him. Um, I went to the University of Miami, so there's nothing that I like about the University of Florida at all, I will tell you that, <laughs> other than this guy. And, I mean, I'm going to let you do uh, the due diligence on this, but I just feel like this guy can do anything that he wants against an opponent. I know he's shown it in the SEC. Tell me all you can about Kyle Pitts, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that you know about this young man. Well, there's zero bad and there's zero ugly. Good. I mean, the kid, the, I have yet to be able to find a flaw. I mean, he's got the NFL shield tattooed on his left pec. So mm. that's something we learned from, you know, you don't get to see these guys without their shirts very often. And on pro day, you know, that was what's one of the things that stood out to me is this is a guy who's been preparing, ready, preparing for the NFL long enough now that he, he got the NFL shield you know, tatted up on his on his pec. So, I mean, this guy, he's been dating the same girl for a long time. Not one red flag. Maybe if you really want to nitpick, uh, you know, the guy sat out a game late in the season, but that was the coaches forced him to do that, and he sat out the bowl game. He opted out of the bowl game, but, you know, nobody's going to blame guys these days for yeah. doing that. You know, bowl games are mostly meaningless. Uh, but that is un that is completely nitpicky. He did not drop a single ball last year that I saw that was like within his catch radius. I mean, he was just so fantastic. Nobody could cover him. Cornerbacks, safeties, linebackers, late safeties and linebackers looked silly covering him. Cornerbacks, big rangy cornerbacks, a little bit better. But even then, he ran away from some guys. He ran away from the Kentucky kid who's considered a second round pick. Just ran away from him. So there's nothing wrong with Kyle Pitts. I mean, he's absolutely going to be a top 10 pick, and, you know, no one would be surprised to see him go in the top five. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything that, that you thought was just confirmed on his pro day. He looks the part. He, you know, he jumped fine. He ran better than people expected. The wingspan was fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Uh, he <laughs> is uh, a model citizen. From all aspects, from from everybody you talk to, model citizen on and off the field, and he's going to make somebody really happy in a month. I'm sure. All right, I want to follow up on a couple things here, Mark, and then Jeff can obviously pop back in as he pleases. Thank you. The one thing that I caught my eye, I expected to turn on the tape, and and I watched his receiving snaps first, and I'm like, wow, you know, he makes catches on balls that are thrown behind him. He makes Kyle Trask look great he'll make any quarterback look great but what I was really impressed by you have a guy like that and he has all those skills as a receiver you would think that he just wouldn't have to care about blocking and he could just mail it in there and be fine and by the way he probably would be people would still pick him in the top 10 anyway but the kid tries and he seems to care and the blocking's there which you know it's great to have a 6'6 wide receiver that tests better with Mike Evans you put him out there at the x spot and you're fine what's even better than that a 6'6 wide receiver that you could put at tight end and create matchup issues with because the kid is actually a willing blocker. Now, he's not going to be a point of attack guy, mm -hmm. but he's also not going to screw up plays by just whiffing on people, which to me is huge. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean that's the that's the one thing that the big concern going into last year was could he take a step as a blocker, and he proved that he could. He could be an inline guy. He's not going to be, you know, you know, a ten year Mercedes Lewis point of attack of guy. Uh, but what he can do is hold his own in there. He can certainly move people, move defensive ends, move linebackers, hold his own uh, against. You know, maybe a guy he's given up some, you know, 20, 30, 40 pounds to. He can hold his own against those guys. He's not going to embarrass him himself. He's not going to embarrass you in the run game by any stretch of the imagination. And like, like you said, he's, if you get him in the right setup with the right team, with the right uh, coordinator who can be creative with him, I think the sky's the limit with this guy because he is such a matchup issue. And you can do so many things. I think Dan Mullen even said it last week was like, he, if you get him with the right guy, and that's going to be important, is getting him with the right coordinator, somebody who's going to be creative with him. Because you, know, you can't just line him up in the same spot and expect him to be, to be dominant. But if you can move him around, get him, get him in, in those matchup issues where he's on a linebacker or on a safety or maybe even on an inside cornerback, uh, you know, you're going to, or one on one, you're just going to. Uh, you're get the you know what you can do with him, you know is limitless because that's how good he is in everything you do. Mark, you know you mentioned about his movement. Um, I think that's the most attractive thing about his skill set to me is the fact that if you do find that offensive coordinator that can utilize that movement skill set that he has, um, he's going to definitely win a lot of his matchups. Um, and, you know, I know that it's about 50%, maybe a little less than at playing wide receiver than he did tight end, which kind of transitions itself very good into the National Football League because you know that the tight end position is has, it's just a hybrid. It's, it's totally changed, that position, over the years. Um, let me ask you this. So it is pro day. I know if you're a scout and you're some of these coaches that came and watched him do the, what he did on his pro day, if there's one thing that, that – that, co- that people were scratching their head about because they already knew that he was fast, he was big, he was tall, all that kind of stuff. What was the one thing that you think that the coaches and the GMs and, co- and the head coaches took out of that, that pro day that they were like, wow, okay, this guy is legit. We know that this is now he's, he's the real deal. Was it his speed, the one he ran I, the 40 I, in? Yeah, I would say four four five is is really good for a tight end. It's not quite – Vernon Davis, I think, set the – I think he set the pro day mark for a tight end that size, you know, a big, big tight end. I think he ran four three eight, Vernon Davis, and he was the sixth overall pick in two thousand and six. So when Pitts comes and runs a four four five, which is certainly in that ballpark, I think that's anybody who had questions about his speed, which nobody should have, because I think it shows up on tape. Uh, I think the one thing to me, Jeff, is his sheer, sheer size. I mean, you 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 because know, you don't know. He looks like a tight end on film. I mean, he looks like a he's big enough to be a tight end, but he looks like a receiver the way he runs on film. He's got unbelievable hands. But I think when he stretched out at the pro day, and his wingspan was eighty three and a half inches, I think people went wow. Mm-hmm. You know, even on an NFL, even by NFL standards for tight ends, that's pretty pretty darn wide wingspan. Uh, that one was pretty big. Twenty two reps on the bench press. That was another one. You wondered, okay, here he is. He's a tall, rangy guy, 6'6", 245. He's certainly cut, but uh, you wonder, you know, what, how much strength is back there. And, again, I think doing the 22 reps just backed up that what you saw on tape, that this guy can move people. He is not uh, some wide receiver playing, playing tight end or a wide receiver in a tight end, uh, in a, you know, a small tight end body. He is legitimate tight end who can do it all and then mark the last thing i'll ask you about him because i think what why we like having the the local reporters on to talk about these guys that you you know might see things or hear things about the guys that you know we don't we can watch them on tape but we miss out on all that stuff that only you can glean from being around these guys and i know COVID has made that a little bit more difficult but the one thing i really liked watching kyle pitts do his interviews after the pro day and i always worry about this with the big time pass catchers I want that diva factor low, and and I don't sense an ounce of diva in this kid listening to him address the media and just talk to people. Yeah, and you know, honestly, he he did actually he you know raised a few eyebrows afterwards because he's he's always been a very open and honest and very well well spoken guy, but he's never been a trash talker or you know 
pat himself on the back or I need to get the ball more. That's never been his 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 stick or his spiel or even you know you even get a hint of that. But I will say this: the after the pro day, he did just raise a little eyebrows because the first time he's ever really said anything with an inkling of maybe making a headline where he said, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like I'll be the best to ever do it. Talking about the tight, he thinks he's going to be the best tight end to ever play the position. He's got the skill level and he's got the work ethic and he's got everything, all the intangibles to make it happen. So for him to say that, I, you know, I get it that that's kind of, you know, that's just being confident in yourself. Uh, But, you know, he's trying to get drafted higher. I get all that, but for this guy, for what we've seen for three years, that was a little out of character. And for him, certainly headline material, because he's never said anything close to that where he felt like he could be the best ever to do it. But I get where most people would say, yeah, that's just, you know, any guy, any normal first-round pick being pretty confident in himself. Uh, the reality is nobody would be surprised if, you know, if he did actually turn out to be one of the, you know, the best or one of the best to ever play the position. All right, I'm going to jump over here, Jeff, to uh, sure. Kadarius Tony then, sure. and and Mark he ju- he tested off the charts, which we kind of expected. You know, watching him this year, I think he he played really well. I guess my question for you about him would be pretty simple. We know he's a great athlete. How good of a technical wide receiver is he to this point where you can trust him to run the whole route tree, make the adjustments you need him to make, and things of that nature, or is he still really more of just an offensive weapon? Well, he's definitely an offensive weapon, and he's a guy who you could you could put back there to return kicks and return punts. He's he's done that at Florida, uh, but what he did this past season is was he took a huge jump from 2019 to 2020 in being a complete receiver. Uh, 2019, 2020, 2019, he certainly was playing behind a lot of guys: uh, Van Jefferson, Kyle Pitts, Freddie Swain, Trey, uh, Trey Grimes. So he's playing a lot of guys, and he and he got hurt there. But he only had ten catches for 194 yards and a touchdown in 2019. And he just really, you know, a lot of those guys graduated, moved on. But he just became, you know, he stayed healthy. That was number one. But then he just became this unbelievably complete guy where he wasn't trying to do too much. He really, the first, you know, three years of his career, it was like he was so, you know, he's doing so much dancing when he got the ball. And, he would cut back and he would lose yards sometimes. And that was the thing that Dan Mullen had said was, I got to be able to trust him to, you know, to go get four yards. You know, you don't have to turn it into 25 or 30 every time or 50 or a touchdown. But that's what we got to get through his head that, hey, a four yard gain's okay. They're not always going to be game breakers. And that's what he did. Uh, not only did he have much better hands as a senior, but he caught 70 balls for almost 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. Uh, he was fantastic running the route tree, fantastic, you know, catching the ball, making people miss when he did and not. And the number one thing that I think everybody will tell you who watched him regularly was, you know, he stopped trying to do too much. He really, really played within the confines of the playbook, the confines of the play, uh, and, and just, you know, took what was there. And that turned him into a guy they could, they had, they, they wanted to get the ball in his hands before, but were worried that, you know, it could lead to something bad to a guy they realize that, okay, we got to get the ball in his hand, you know, 10 times a game. And that's really pretty much what they did. Uh, the one thing I will say about him, he's not Kyle Pitts from a, from a clean sheet standpoint. Um, he did, you know, he does have that. Uh, he was pulled over for a traffic citation and, and caught with an, it was an AR-15, I believe, in the back of his car. <laughs> And he didn't get, you know, didn't get in trouble for it. But I think some people see that as okay. It's certainly a little bit of a red flag. Is here's a guy, you know, what kind of a guy has an AR-15? And, you know, and he, <laughs> maybe it was legal, maybe, you know. But again, why do you have an AR-15? Why is it in the back of your car? Yes, it was unloaded. And I do believe it was. By, they didn't give him a ticket for it. I think he it was all registered and everything. But it's like, you know, what is this guy doing with an AR- AR-15? So I think if. If there's a red flag, that would be it. Uh, but you know, he's you know he seems to be by all accounts a good kid. That was a few years ago, so uh, he's got a second career as a rapper. He does have a he has a, some rap songs out there where he's done that. Um, so you know, if football doesn't work, he's got that to fall back on. 
Well, maybe the maybe the gun was part of a, a music video he was doing in a rapping video or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I, he probably maybe he should have told him it wasn't real. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I noticed that his in looking at his snaps and and where he played um, in 2019. When you mentioned he didn't play a lot, um, they started him out at the slot position, played slot, a little yep. bit of outside, but primarily slot was where he played in 2020. Looks like he did very good from there. Um, do you kind of envision a team going after him as that slot receiver? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that's where he's going to be. You know, most impactful. Not that he can't play outside because I do think he's got the speed and if, if anybody questioned his speed there were questions about you know was he did he really have that top end speed and I think you know f- at least his 40 yard dash showed that uh, you know he's another guy around that 4-4 that four, four, you know Mark shows that uh, you know he's got some top end speed and maybe more so than a lot of people thought because I think everybody thought it was, he's had a lot of wiggle and, and that would be his one downfall but uh, he ran well and I do think he's he can play outside, but I do think his future is going to be as a slot receiver. I just think that's where uh, he's going to be the most dangerous. Get him he's got the ability to get into some open space. Uh, he is tough as nails, even though he's had some injury issues. He has uh, proven to be really, really tough. Uh, taking some hits, especially last year. So uh, that's where I I envision him being a slot receiver, and probably why he's not going to be. Uh, Jamar Chase with, you know, the first guy off the board. Trayvon Guy Drimes is someone that's interesting to me, Mark, because you look at his measurables, 6'4", 220. He ran a 4'4", at his pro day, and a sub-7 second three-cone drill, a 4'2", short shuttle, which is pretty good. You look at the measurables, you're like, why? Why isn't this guy being talked about as a early day two pick? I'm not sure he's going to go there. He's probably more than likely a, a mid-round, maybe like a, a fourth-round type of selection. So with all those things that Grimes has going for him at 6'4", 220, why do you think he's not being talked about as being one of those kind of day-two selections? Yeah, it's, it's stunning, honestly. I, it's one, it is the most stunning thing. I actually would have thought going into the draft process, I actually thought Grimes would be a, a big-time riser. I thought he would be a guy that people got around – Saw him, saw how physical he is, how big he is, what a good blocker he is. Uh, unbelievable catch radius, great hands, un- great speed. And I really, I thought he would be a guy who would start out as maybe behind Tony, and then by the time we got to the draft, he'd be the guy, the big riser, and be ahead of Tony. But it does not look like that's going to be the case. I'm still a little surprised by it. I, I would think he inter- would interview well. Uh, I think, you know, he's obviously very good on tape. Uh, he's a guy who can play, should play outside with that kind of speed, that kind of size. Uh, so I'm a little surprised, to be honest. Why? I don't know. I can't tell you why he's not as high as I thought he would be. But I, I still think somebody will look at him and, and maybe take a runner on him uh, late in the second round, early in the third. I would be stunned if he goes, if he's a fourth-round pick, honestly. If, he, if he's on the board there after the end of all those comp picks at the end of the third round, I would be, I'd be very, very surprised. I just don't think, I think he's got too much talent, uh, too much upside to be sitting there in the fourth round. And if somebody does get him in the fourth, that is going to be an unbelievable steal. Or he's six foot four. That's you know, yeah. those don't just grow on trees these days. I think that that's uh, it's interesting that you know, and a guy like this coming out of the SEC in Florida at six foot four. Um, complimentary receiver, he's going to be fine. I think he'll he'll be good. I mean, it's, it's funny because John had mentioned that the reason we, we like to talk to people like you, Mark, is that we get the insiders on a lot of the stuff that, and it's amazing to me that you kind of don't, you don't understand why. And it's, it is a little bit weird that just, you know, what's the deal here? But um, it's good to hear that it's, if somebody does take him, he's definitely going to get a chance somewhere. Uh, John, I'll transition over to Kyle yeah, Trask. Um, here's a guy that I feel like has a lot to prove. Uh, you know, one of the quarterbacks that I know he's being slighted because there's so many of the good ones in the draft this year. But it sounds to me and looks to me like he went into his pro day, had a pretty good day throwing the football. And um, I think that there's a, there's some questions still out there. But did he do good for himself at the pro day the other day? Yeah, he did fine. I think he did everything, showed everything that we thought he was. Uh, you know, he his, his goal was going to pro day and, quote, show that I'm not a statue back there, end sure, quote. And that's, that's, the, that's, the that's what he here. wanted to do. So you saw in his in his passing, he ran everything that he could run. He's running the three-cone drill. He's running the 40-yard dash twice. 
he just wanted to show people that I can run. I am I'm mobile. I got better than average speed. All those things. And then when you went when he went into his his actual passing, uh, you know, playbook there and and did all of his passing drills. Everything was him moving, 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 rolling left, rolling right, stepping up, throwing. So I, I it was a very clear and conscious effort for him to show the 31 teams that were there uh, that that this is what I can do. I can move. Uh, I don't know how if he convinced anybody. Who knows? I know this. When you look at the potential for four quarterbacks to go in the first four picks, right? I mean, that's I'd be a, maybe I maybe I'm crazy, but I certainly think it's going to go that way. Maybe the Jets do something different, but uh, you know they're going to be. They'll you got to think four quarterbacks are gone in the top ten, right? So Kyle Trask, to me, I think he's going to be a very interesting, you know, subject there uh, sitting on the board prospect there in the late late in the first round maybe early in the second somebody somewhere needs a quarterback's going to go you know we could do a lot worse than Kyle Trask uh so he did he definitely showed what he's capable of he doesn't have you know he's got a strong arm but it's not the strongest arm out there he's got some mobility but he's not the fastest quickest guy out there it's like he checks all the box but he doesn't woo you with any of the boxes and so that's the problem with Kyle Trask is he's just kind of you know uh, jack of all trades, master of none, and I almost think that's a slight on him. But I don't, I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it as a slight because he's just really good. And I think probably the one thing that is his best is he's really, really smart. He's very hard worker, and he's unbelievable pre-snap read, uh, which are great, great attributes to have as a quarterback. And you could do a lot worse, <laughs> and teams do. NFL teams do a lot worse than Kyle Trask every single year. Last guy I want to touch on before we kind of let you talk about the the rest of the group, Mark. You know, a guy who I think his pro day was lost in the mix because of the other big names in the quarterback is cornerback Marco Wilson. <laughs> I mean, the guy comes in at five yeah. eleven, one ninety one. You're like, all right, that kind of looks like a slot corner. That's fine. Maybe he could play outside. Okay. Then you see the four three seven forty yard dash. Then you see twenty six reps on the bench <laughs> at five eleven, yep. one ninety. Then you see the six eight three cone and the four one three short shuttle. Oh, and by the way, the forty three inch vertical and eleven four broad. And I'm like, holy cow! <laughs> tell me about tell me about Marco Wilson. Good point. Well, first off, I'm going to correct you. Forty three and a half inch uh, vertical. My bad. My bad. You're right. Yeah, I mean that that extra half inch. I mean, yeah, it, the guy was the guy was fantastic. He looked in great shape i mean he did everything what i will say is you know what team is going to look at the tape and go okay what this guy did at the pro day overshadows two years of what we've seen on tape Mm -hmm. uh because to me on tape he was not very good not very good last year not very good the year before where'd they Uh, use him did they use him mostly inside or outside both. He, he's, he, they moved him inside in 19, and they moved him back outside in 20. So he's played both. Um, he was at his best as a freshman in 2017. He got hurt in 2018. 2017 as a freshman, they they were four and I think they were four and seven. Bad team. Got the coach fired, but he was one of those bright spots. Him and C.J. Anderson on the opposite side. And there were people at that point who thought Marco Wilson would be better than C.J. Henderson. Wow. And obviously, C.J. Henderson was the ninth overall pick last year by the Jags, and Marco Wilson considered coming out last year, but didn't. Came back to school for one more year, uh, and wanted to maybe take his game to the next level and try to be become a first round pick. And it just didn't happen. He did not have a good year. The whole defense was pretty bad, um, and he, you know, he was getting beat left and right, and you know, sometimes wasn't even in the in the play. So it was a little, it's been a little head scratching. And then when you saw, you know, you saw him throw the shoe against LSU, you're like, what is he doing? You know, and that mm-hmm. kind of caps what we've seen from him for two years. But then, you know, here he goes. He goes out to Arizona, goes out to Exos, and got himself in fantastic shape. Really, really trained. Clear. It's very clear that he trained for the pro day. Um, but the question will be, you know, okay, did he, you know, <laughs> did he just train for the pro day? <laughs> You know, what can he do on the field and when the you know, when it's real? And what I've seen the last two years is, you know, 
I, I would take a flyer on him, but I wouldn't take him before the fourth round. And I now I don't think he's I don't think he'll be there in the fourth round. It's the same thing. I think he's I think, um, a couple of people have him as top fifteen cornerback, which is usually right. You know, usually fifteen cornerbacks go in the first three rounds. Sure. So I would guess he's going to go in that third round. But given what he did at the pro day, maybe some crazy GM looks at that over what he's put on game tape and said, hey, you know, we can make this guy. You know, we can make this guy better or or what they saw on tape, they'll dismiss it as bad coaching or bad guys around him, something. Uh, but uh, to me, if I'm the GM, I'm, I'm very leery because of what he's done the last two years on the field. Mark, I have to follow up because I know a lot of our fans here, they don't necessarily follow college football that quickly, and I'm sure it's a story that college football fans know about, but maybe they don't. Can you get into more detail about the shoe throwing incident against LSU, please? <laughs> I think that's why most most people know of him. <laughs> I mean, really. yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Quincy, his brother plays there in in New York. Plays for the the uh, the Jets now, right? No, he's with the Giants. So Quincy Wilson lives there. Um, but yeah, they you know out of the just you know game on the line against LSU, uh, and. Makes a tackle on third down. It's a four-yard gain, I think, on a third and ten play. Makes a great tackle near the sideline, and as he's tackling the guy as a tight end, he the shoe the guy's shoe comes off, and you know Quincy Wilson instead of standing up and celebrating with all his teammates, he just inexplicably inexplicably, inexplicably throws the shoe ten yards downfield, and uh, it, it was just stunning. And you know the officials threw a penalty. And kept the driver alive. LSU goes down and kicks the game-winning field goal in a fog. So uh, that 15-yard penalty cost Florida a chance. LSU surely would have punted there. They were deep in their own territory. They would have punted. Florida would have got the ball back with, you know, with a few minutes left, had a chance to go in and, and beat LSU. And instead, and, and LSU hadn't stopped Florida all day. They were moving the ball pretty well. Um, Florida was, had stopped itself in the second quarter a little bit. And um, so, you know, that was a huge play in that game. And, you know, LSU wins it. Florida did, did, did get a shot to tie. And Evan McPherson, Evan McPherson, who's actually who came out, entered the draft a year early, a little bit of a surprise, who's in there as a, as a kicker. And um, he had a chance and missed a, uh, a long field goal to, to win it for Florida. But uh, a stunning Stunning mental error by by uh, Marco Wilson there, and you know we didn't talk to him. We didn't talk to him after that game. We didn't talk to him for the rest of the season. So getting him at pro day was the first his first opportunity, and he admitted that a lot of teams asked him about it because they want to know. You know, what did he what, say about what, what it? Kind of, what did he say about well, it? Well, he said he admitted that it was a bad mistake. He's like, you know, it was a mistake. I, we were in the the heat of the battle there, and you know, I was. Uh, I just got caught up. My emotions, the shoe sitting there, comes literally in my hand. I really didn't know what to do with it, so I just threw it. <laughs> and I didn't really even realize that it was a penalty. And he's like, I don't run away from it. It's part of my life, and things happen, and this was one of the things that happened, and I'm going to answer it the way I tell everybody. It was just an honest mistake in a game filled with energy. I made a good play, and I was excited, and then I made a, a dumb mistake, and that's how it is. And, Mark- and he wished it never happened, but he handled it. He took it head on. And that's how he's approached it with all these people, with all these scouts. And, again, you go back to here he is. This is a guy who's obviously well-coached on on getting ready for pro day. He's obviously also well-coached on handling a dumb mistake. And, uh, you know, and, and again, I don't think that's going to define him. Certainly it's going to stay with him, but it, it won't define him as a player uh, or as a person for the rest of his life. And you were right, by the way. He was with the Jets, and he was added uh, onto the Giants practice squad late in the year. Um, he was not active for a game, but he was signed to a reserve future contract. So, Mark, you were absolutely right about that. Uh, Jeff, you so asked something. with the Giants now? Or yes. He's with yeah. the Jets now? Yes, he, yeah, he was with the Jets, and he signed. He was one of those late-season practice squad additions, very okay. under the radar. You're absolutely right. Jeff, you got anything else for Mark? Nope, that's good. Thank All right, you. Mark, just any, anyone else that we missed that, that you think is under the radar for Florida that we did not ask you about specifically that you think could make some noise in the right situation in the NFL? Yeah, Stone Forsythe. I mean, you know, this guy, what a great name, Stone Forsythe. And uh, he <laughs> waited three years to get a chance to play. And the, the kids, you know, I think he's 6'9", 320 pounds, uh, played left tackle last year, played really well. Uh, Kyle Trask was 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 not sacked. I think he had like he was giving up ten sacks until the 
until uh, maybe the uh, I think they they really struggled in the bowl game, but uh, but you know he didn't have four receivers, but Stone Forsythe's a guy uh, I would expect him to go in the top 100 picks. He might even go, you know, ahead of Marco Wilson. There's a possibility there, but mammoth left tackle. Uh, if you need a left tackle, this guy would be uh, a guy you, you could take a runner on and feel pretty good about him and, and maybe his upside. So, Mark, when did you fly in a fighter jet? And I ask you this because <laughs> it, if you look at Mark Long's Twitter Feed. And what is yeah. it? Uh, AP Mark Long. Do I have that right, Mark? Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. So if you guys go there, he basically looks like he's added like, like an extra in Top Gun in his Twitter <laughs> profile picture. Tell me about that. I, I've been lucky enough to do it twice, and and that's not many people can say that uh, civilians. But uh, you know the good folks at in NASCAR and the Daytona 500, they've been they've been just fantastic over the years. I cover some auto racing for AP, along with a lot of other things. Uh, but they offered me a chance to fly with the Thunderbirds twice. Oh. And so uh, I I did it both times. I, I took them up on it. And the last time, I don't know if that was 17 or 18, just a few years ago, and uh, wrote a story about it. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. We we get up. I mean, you, I mean, you just, I mean, you almost lose your lunch every single time. They could pass you out. They could make you pass out if they wanted. Well, actually, you know what, Mark? That, that was that, that was that was actually wanted. that was going to be my question. Did you pass out? Because I've seen a million not, videos nine, of I people took, passing out. No, no, did not pass out. I handled nine point three G's. Nice. Uh, it was, it, yeah, it was, in, it was unbelievable. They actually, we actually take off at Daytona. They're right behind the track, at, and then they fly over Kennedy because Kennedy Space Center is a you can't fly over so they get permission to have us fly over there oh. over kennedy because there are no planes going over the over the space center there and so he act, they actually turn the controls over it's a it's a two-seater he's up front i'm in the back we go through everything teaching me this that and the other and then finally he just says hey plane's all yours and Whoa. so you know here i am this oh yeah it's unbelievable this billion dollar plane and you can do i can do anything i want barrel roll uh revert i mean and i did it i did it all uh, and you've un- unbelievably responsive. I don't care what sports car Jeff Spiegel drives with his kids out of <laughs> out of the house. This thing makes your sports car look like a 1997 Saturn. Uh, this That's thing is fantastic. Drive. It is it is responsive. It is ridiculous, and uh, it's it was one of the best things I've ever done. Mark, awesome stuff, my friend. Really, that that is a great story. I'm so happy I asked you about that now. Good stuff, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to talking okay. to you again next year, right, pal? Thank you, Mark. Anytime, guys. Thank okay, you. have a good one.